Hebrews chapter 12. I was thinking when I was here Wednesday evening talking about gratitude and being grateful. I think sometimes I probably haven't shown the gratitude I should show for a congregation of people that year after year continue to be gracious toward me and toward my wife and putting up with us for years. We obviously have not always done everything right. We are trying. We are still learning. Um, I think we recognize expiration dates and all the other kinds of things and it's more and more difficult as things go by when you look in the mirror and realize the graciousness of part of people to, to put up with you. And I'm sure that uh, your time here watching me grow and God working me through a multitude of things, it's probably been more difficult than I recognize. And I am grateful for that, not giving up on me yet. If you give the Lord about another 30 years, I'll be uh, maybe at least a little closer to what I ought to be. Um, I think I've done wrong in not, in not telling you how much I appreciate you coming week in and week out and uh, those kinds of things. And I, I do realize I actually listen to my own preaching every now and then when I, you know, got like nausea and I need to get rid of something. I turn it on and it helps me to get rid of it quicker. But um, I, uh, I, I realize that a lot of that stuff's not easy. Uh, contrary to what some people may believe, I'm not a legend in my own mind. When I look at my sermon preparation, which is somewhat irksome to me at times, I, I think to myself, there's certainly people that could do this a whole lot better. And uh, I, I, uh, I struggle with feeling at times like just a complete and utter failure. Uh, I don't, don't know how to do, but to keep doing, you know, but you know, you'd think, well, why don't you just throw in the towel? Well, I can't throw in the towel. I don't feel like I should. But I don't want you to think either that there's not times where I feel like, well, I'm sure somebody could handle this a whole lot better and do things better. Yes, but I want to get better. Amen. And I want to be better, not just for your benefit, but for my benefit to judgment seat of Christ, but also to be more pleasing to Him. Yes, and uh, the, the older I get, uh, the more I think I am. And so I want to, with that thought in mind, I want to give you a couple of things here in the book of Hebrews here this morning. And uh, I may be a little, um, oh, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe a little tenderhearted, maybe a little tired, maybe uh, whatever you want to uh, say, but I'm in a good spot with the Lord. I'm at peace as far as He is concerned and with the things that have gone on, I know that God knows what He's doing and that kind of stuff. So I'm not, there's not ripples on the pond. But it has brought me to a, a serious consideration of my own personal life with Jesus Christ. Not how well I do with people in communication and not whether or not I'm a success in other people's eyes. But if I were to pass from this life to the next within the next two to three weeks, what do I have to show for it? I think sometimes that I would be uh, like the individual who told me one time they went in to see the doctor. He's a good friend of mine. I'd known him for years and... He actually was concerned about it. He said, hey, would you go to the doctor with me? And I said, well, yeah, I, I, sure, if you want me to. And he said, yeah, I'd appreciate it. And the doctor gave him the diagnosis of stuff, however they do all that, and told him what they were going to have to do. And it was going to require uh, some surgery and several months of rehab. And, and he left out of there. And I said, you know, okay, well, so, you know, when you're going under the knife, I was kind of like there was no question. And he goes, you know something? I don't know if I want to get hurt that bad to get better. didn't resonate with me then. I, I was like, man, you're a young guy. Why would you want to go ahead and have it so you can have it? And he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I want to hurt that bad and go through all of that hassle just for the potential of getting better. Well, I liken that under the Christian life. If the Lord were to tell me like he used to tell preacher, let me read you this. Look in verse number 12, Hebrews 12, 12. Wherefore, lift up hands which hang down, feeble knees, make straight the paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Brother Larry, pray for us, would you please? I need to get rolling here.
We count it a joy, Lord, to be able to pray in this church. And we're grateful, Lord, for what you've done, uh, Lord, here in this ministry and the outreach of it and the working of it. We're grateful, Lord, even on the heels of what preacher said this morning a minute ago. Uh, Lord, we're, we're sure, we're very sure, that because of your faithfulness in this place, because of your faithfulness through him in preaching the word of God, that uh, we'd be nowhere near where we are right now had not been for preaching the word of God in 3857 Hartley Road. Yes. So we give you the praise for this place. I thank you, Lord, for the, the folks that are steady every week, Lord, and we thank you very much, Lord, for the new folks you brought in. And we remember being one of the first ones, Lord. We remember being uh, some of the first few 15, 20 years ago, Lord, coming and really having to ask our, ourselves the question, uh, Lord, uh, do we really want this? And what we were asking ourselves was, do we want to tighten up enough to serve you and yes, listen right. to the word of God and get yes. right with you? Right. Yep. So we want to praise your name, not that we're perfect or right, totally. Amen. But Lord, that we did have a desire and still do to get something done for you and to listen to the word of God and listen to correction and direction under the authority of the word of God in this man. Thank you for him. We lift him up before you now, and I pray your power might rest on him. I pray you'd use him in spite of all the difficulties and the things uh, that are going on in all of our lives, and theirs as well. Bless his dear wife and continue to be with her, and uh, help us all for what a help that she is to us, not only to the preacher. Amen. Amen. And we'll give you the glory for everything that's said and done, and we'll lift you up and point you out, Lord, no matter what's done Amen. and how you Amen. decide to do it. Amen. Uh, we're going to give you the praise. Thank you for this place. Thank you for this building, uh, Lord, and thank you yes. for the comfort of it, God, that we might listen to the word of God in this place. In yes. Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you for standing to be seated. I sat there with my friend in the doctor's office, and the surgery was not a life and death thing, but it was a definitely a comfort thing. We got back in the car, and we were going to go grab some lunch or something somewhere, and um, I said, so, you know, when are you going under the knife? And he, and he said that I, I never even thought of, that there was even a choice to make. He said, I don't know if I want to hurt that bad and go through that much for the potential of getting better. I look at my Christian life sometimes and I think maybe I would have the same idea that if the Lord were to say to me like he, preacher Roloff preached years and years and years ago when he talked about uh, the black heart of wickedness being taken out and having it replaced with a new heart and having to have the surgery, you have to lay down on the table and have open heart surgery and have the old heart removed and a new heart put in. I've thought oftentimes whether or not I really do want to get better. I've thought oftentimes whether I even think there's anything wrong with me. I got a text this morning from a dear friend of mine and he just had a few complimentary things to say and a couple things about mama and dad, sis and that and the other. And he ended the thing with, he said, you know, preacher, it'd be good to just preach from your heart. Well, that can be a dangerous thing because the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful of all things who can know it. So I, I understand that. I'll try to give you some from the Bible. But what I'm thinking about in my own personal life is, as I've grown older, have I gotten stale? Have I gotten moldy? Have I gotten mildewed? Do I, do I miss that call to surface like the old war horses that when even though they had been shot up and cut up and beat up and every time that thunder would begin to roll out over that mountain pasture, those war horses would begin to line up across that pasture and lean into and face that storm coming like they used to lean into the cannon fire. I look at myself and say, you know, I'm, I'm an old war horse and just in the pasture somewhere, I'm over here and when the thunder rolls, I turn and go the other way because it's too much for me anymore. Don't want to change, already arrived, already gotten there. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. I'm not trying to make it personal to you, I'm talking about from my heart. I think it's easy as we grow older to get very accustomed, to get very comfortable, to get to the point where it's kind of like, well, I'll just keep doing what I've been doing. I remember when we buried a friend of mine that got uh, killed at the sheriff's office and we had the whole police funeral and all of the stuff that took place and, and it's a very tearful thing, a very moving thing. When everybody comes in and they blow taps and the 21 gun salute in those days, the helicopters would fly over in formation and stuff and they fold the flag and give the flag over to uh, the, the next of kin and those kind of things. It's a very moving kind of a celebration because you're there. It's, a, 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 it's, it's out of respect for the person that's given their life for the benefit of somebody else and often they don't even know them. 
but willing to bleed for them and watch the widow leave broken hearted and the children leave broken hearted and the mamas and the daddies leave and I remember a guy coming into my office and uh, at the time I was uh, a lieutenant and he came in and he said uh, who do I need to see to resign and I said well how come you resign and you're doing a good job everything's working out okay he said yeah but I don't know that I want to pay that price the reality of recognizing that what had occurred was not because of a happenstance. The guy was in the middle of something that transpired and it cost him his life. And you know what the guy said? And I got to respect him for it. You know what he said? I don't know that I want to pay that price. And I get to read in my Bible when we got these things that are going on. I don't think they're happenstance things that are happening. And I don't think it's all the devil contrary to what everybody might believe because I don't really believe I'm making a mark in eternity. I think I would have that demon show up and say, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who in the blazes are you? I don't know that they know my name in hell. It's easy to blame those things on something else, but the fact of the matter is, I think it's the Lord saying, you need surgery. And I need to take, Hebrew, take Hebrews 4.12, the word of God, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and I need to divide some things. Amen. I need to cut some things out. I need to add some things in. I need to do something. I need to sow the right kind of things because otherwise you're just going to get old and stale and moldy, and before long you're going to be in a coffin. I also realize that as I've gotten older, I've changed. Level of toleration changes and, uh, and different things occur and I, I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I guess maybe, I, maybe I'm less gracious but I recognize uh, people oftentimes are less gracious. I think sometimes when you've been around a long while it's kind of just expected that you know, I got it all under control and everything's fine and all that kind of deal. I recognize sometimes, man, I'm on a wing and a prayer and if God don't get me through, I ain't gonna get through. Well, you shouldn't reveal that to the people. Why not be honest? Amen. Why not tell you that I get frightened like you get frightened when God does something and I don't understand it and I don't get it and I got to go to my knees just like you go to your knees and I got to pray just like you got to pray and I have conflicts just like you have conflicts and I have concerns like you have concerns and I have worries. Oh, yes, I have worries. Am I doing right? Am I acting right? Am I being right? Am I doing what I'm supposed to? And when somebody says, well, what about this and what about that? Did I give the right advice? Did I say the right thing? Did I preach with the right motive? Did I do that stuff? I find myself much more introspective as I get old. I almost become so cautious that I can become careless. Brother Lynch used to tell me, and he two purple hearts in a cluster and don't have time to go into all the details there, but let's just say that in Vietnam, he was in the thick of it. And Brother Lynn said that there's two things that you know right off the bat. As soon as somebody steps off the helicopter, you stay away from them because chances are better than not. If you're going to get killed in country, you're going to get killed in the first three months of action or you're going to get killed in the last 30 days of action. Yeah. And I said, well, explain the difference to me. He said, the difference is this. He said, when you first get there, you're so stupid, you don't know anything. You won't listen to anybody. You think you know everything, and you just become a bullet stop. After you've been there for a while, time and country teaches you things you couldn't learn any other way, and you realize if somebody has survived that this amount of time, they must know something you don't know, and you learn to hang around with people who know more than you do. But he said, by the time you come to the end of your tour, you become so careful, you become dangerous. Because you didn't realize that what kept you alive in country was your willingness to die because you already saw yourself dead. Yes. Yes. Then you become self-preserving toward the end of your tour and you're going to get yourself killed or someone else killed. He said, the better thing to do is, is for you to just stay in the camp when everybody goes out in the last 30 days. You say, well, they called it getting short. And he said, I can't tell you how many of my friends, Fergie was one of them, he said, I can't tell you how many of my friends died in that last 30 days. You say, why? They lost that ability to stay careful and cautious and next thing you know, they become so cautious they become dangerous. I wonder if I've settled for where I'm at. 
I wonder if I'm comfortable where I'm at. Almost as if I've reached the pinnacle of the temple and there's no room for growth anymore. I'm just asking myself, I'm examining myself. I, I look at this, if the Lord were to come to me and say, hey, uh, you're sick, do you want to be healed? No, nah, Lord, you know what? I don't think I want to go through that pain. I don't want to think I want to go through that hurt. I don't think that I really want to feel the knife of your word cutting me up. I, I, Lord, I don't mind attending someone else's surgery. Don't mind going in there and praying over them before you run the anesthesia in there and take them back to the back room. And Lord, I did that when I was younger, but I don't know that I really want to go through that anymore. I'm getting old now. And I start looking at the Apostle Paul's life and contrary to what people think, the Apostle Paul, as he grew older, he never lost that edge that said, Lord, I still, 27 years after his salvation experience on the road to Damascus, the Apostle Paul said, I still have a problem with me. Cut me open, Lord. Deal with me, Lord. You know where we are in modern society now? We're in modern society to the point that has even infected and affected our churches to the point that it's no longer personal in the sense of God dealing with you. Now all of a sudden everything becomes personal because personalities get involved. No longer is it God orchestrating things in our lives to try to help us to get better as Christians. All of a sudden now there's some other excuse. Nonetheless, I'm going to say, I know now I need surgery. And there's no better person to get the surgery from than the great physician. He knows exactly what needs to be cut. His scalpel is fine and it is sharp, but I don't really like the way he goes about his preoperative care, his preparation. Come back where we were this morning to 2 Corinthians. Paul went to three years of Bible school on the backside of the desert with the greatest instructor there ever was. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. Teaching Paul things that had never been taught before giving Paul mysteries that had never been given before. Dealing with the Apostle Paul in a way that was contrary to how the Apostle Paul had been trained both by Agabus, the lawyer, and by Judaizers' customs. Now the Lord has come to Paul and imagine him entrusting him with the ministry that was brand new and saying, Paul, now I'd like for your mentor to be Samuel. Don't let a word of what I'm giving you drop to the ground. And all of a sudden, Paul said, okay, well, good, no problem at all. I know the law, I've been loaning it from my youth up. I know how, how to do this and how to do that and where to go with this and where to go with that. And the Lord said, no, we're changing all of that. And not only that, I'm changing your congregation. You're not going to preach to people you're comfortable with. You're not going to preach to people, Paul, that are like you at all, other than they are breathing, they got eyeballs and hair and teeth, and they walk and they talk. Other than being humans, Paul, they are literally entirely <coughs> different than you are. Not only that, Paul, they're the ones you despised. They're the ones that your customs taught and showed you were the outcast. We called them dogs. We called them heathen. We called them barbarians. That's your new congregation, Paul. New message, new congregation. Now I got to learn something I did not know from my youth up. And guess what's going to happen? It's going to run contrary to everybody you've known and everybody that has helped you or assisted you along the way. Tell them, que sera, sera, goodbye, see you later, Paul. I'm sending you to a whole new group of people. I'm done with them. Now, are you ready to get on board? And Paul's thinking, I don't know. Would you be willing to have that surgery? That's a lot. I don't, I don't know if I was the Apostle Paul. I've now gotten old enough to remove myself. I read Fox's Book of Martyrs or Martyr's Mirror or a couple of other books that I read. I look at those saints that are there, children and women that have the courage of a lion and I no longer say, oh, I would do that. 
I look at it and go, thank God I wasn't born then. I probably would have denied him. I wouldn't have let him burn. If I could save my neck, I probably would. You say, why? I save my neck now even when there's no danger of fire. Just a little bit of pressure and I'm already crumbling. They're not tying me to a stake, imprisoning me, not feeding me. They're not torturing me. And all of a sudden, just the slightest little wrinkle and the Lord's like, are you kidding me? You're giving up that quick? Well, Lord, I just, I don't know if I can take it anymore. Well, all things work together for good to them that love God, then that according to his purpose. You love me, don't you? Well, yeah, Lord, but that surgery's gonna hurt. Well, yeah, but you have to hurt to get better. I lost the desire to be hurt. I've learned a lot more from pain than I have prosperity. Pain's been a great teacher for me. Played a little bit of sports, wasn't a great athlete or anything like that. Played enough sports to, you know, get an opportunity to play a little here and there and things like that. And, and I had an idea in my mind of what I, the sports were going to do for me. And uh, a guy came around the corner one time and knocked me on my can and uh, another other guy fell on the back side of my leg and clipped me and, you know, flag flown and all that other stuff. But that ended everything right there. The pain said, you can't do that anymore. Changed the direction of everything. I look back now and go, man, thank God. But back then, everything I had planned and even that some had planned for me changed in one incident and said, you're no longer going to do that. You better find something else to do. So great that thing was that when time came for me to apply for where I, my heart was at the time, I had to go to three or two different doctors and get special letters for them to allow me to become a police officer because of what I sustained when I was doing what I loved in sports because they said eventually that thing is going to put you down and we're not going to be liable for it. I'm grateful that the Lord worked all that stuff out, but I sure didn't like the pain it caused. But that pain redirected things. It changed a course for me and caused me to have, in a sense, a surgery that I did not want to have. Now I'm in the Christian life and I look at my life and I think to myself how bold I was back in the days of playing ball and how stupid I was and, and the first few years uh, when I became a policeman I'm thinking man you have got to be kidding me. I look back now at what I did then and I begin to shake and I'm thinking you are an idiot. I mean I did some really I mean like crazy stuff. Tell us what it is. No, then you'll think I'm crazy. You'll fire me. If you did that, you're, you're nuts. But I had a goal in mind and it was to get the bad guy and to help the little guy. And, and that overrode the fear and the danger that I didn't have any better sense than to recognize. But as I got older, I'm like, I don't do that anymore. Let somebody else kick that door down. I do not have to be the first one through the door anymore. Get you on them shields up there. I mean, do all that stuff. I'm glad they got all that stuff now. But are you hearing me in the Christian life? I'm trying to make application. We've gotten comfortable. We don't want the surgery anymore. The reason is, is because we'll never go to the doctor and say, Lord, I just want to know, do I, do I need surgery? I'm here for my yearly checkup. Do you see anything here that's not where it ought to be. You're hearing something strange in my heart that you haven't heard before. You see in something in my vision that wasn't there a year ago, something that's occluded it, something that has blocked it, something that has changed it, some directional change that has taken. Lord, have you noticed and have I become deaf now where I can't hear you anymore and immobile where I can't move the direction you want to? Hey, Lord, I'm here for a checkup. And in my life, the Lord said, well, there's only one solution. Thank God you're saved and sealed for the day of redemption, but you need surgery. 
I need surgery. Lord, you know, the older you get, the more dangerous surgery becomes. I mean, you know, can we do something arthroscopically? Can we do something, uh, you know, something? Can you do something with drugs or medications or something? Can you help me with my problem without being so invasive? Do you have to bust me open? Do you have to break my heart? Do you have to tear me out of the frame and have me stay awake night after night after night? Lord, if that's what it takes. Well, you need surgery. We're going to do it old school. But I'm going to have to hurt you to help you. I used to go just for the purpose. Imagine how stupid. Just for the purpose of being able to be a part of a game because of pride or whatever you want to call it and have them take that stinking needle <laughs> with a shoulder harness on it and have that doctor not even give you Novocaine and slide that thing underneath my kneecap and you can feel it kind of grinding in there and it's like, and of course everybody's around you're like, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. And start pulling on that needle. And that thing's sucking like you're trying to get the last little bit of sweet tea out of the bottom of the glass. And it's sucking and bubbles are coming up and that old greenish yellow pus filled fluids coming out from under there. Oh yeah, the swelling's going down, but man. And then here's the wild thing. After they're done pulling that off, then they give you the Novocaine and tape you up like a cast just so you can go make an appearance for an hour or so. And the Lord said, yeah, we're not going to be able to pull the fluid off. I'm going to have to go in and I'm going to have to cut down both sides. I'm going to have to expose where the problem is. Come on, preacher. Yeah. And I'm probably going to have to replace the joint that's bad. And you're going to walk with a limp the rest of your life. Lord, I think I'll just live with uh, pulling my fluid off every now and then and let it kind of coagulate around my ankle and stuff for a while and then I'll prop my leg up and put some ice on it and I'll just keep nursing it until that fluid turns cancerous. The next thing you know, the option for having surgery is gone. You've got to have an amputation. Are you with me so far? Yes, sir. I'm just trying to tell you in my heart. I don't want to finish my course any different than Paul. I want to go out with my hair on fire and my hind end catching. I want to go out preaching how God would have me to preach. I'd love to go out like my daddy did, preach his last sermon the size of a baseball hernia right here, stuck his hand down inside his belt and held himself this way while he preached, pressing on his diaphragm and that kind of a thing. Oh, preacher, that's just ridiculous. Man, what a way to go. Amen. Go out like the old preacher, still preaching. But I realize that's because they had the character to allow somebody to keep doing surgery on them. I've come to the realization that I can have that surgery in the very beginning. And the older I get, the more probable it is that I'm going to have to have more surgeries just to keep me in the condition I need to be to finish the course. They have the potential for more surgeries later in life because the previous life catches up with you. Before long, the pain begins to overtake you and now all you have is, other than being a dope head, is to go ahead and just take the surgical option. But tell me, don't think about it for a minute now, how many more people in the regular hospital or any mores? It's more of us older people. More of the older people who wind up beginning to break down. And I can say this to you unequivocally without apology, spiritually speaking. It is the old people that need surgery. Concreted. Set up. Unwilling to change. Unwilling to do what God would have us to do. Why? It's uncomfortable. It's hard. It's difficult. 
gotten comfortable in the recliner, comfortable in the hammock, comfortable with our feet up on the sofa. Hey, don't cut on me. But don't mind being the scalpel to cut everyone else. Yeah. I'm talking about your age spiritually. I'm not talking about your physical age. Yeah. Good. In 2 Corinthians 12, I'm going to try, I'm going to show you a surgical procedure that never stopped in the Apostle Paul's life. Let's pick it up in 11. Paul here is talking about, as I mentioned to you earlier, he's talking about his ministry. Paul's our pattern, is that right? I wonder if this was read at every ordination, how many would be willing to say, I'm willing to go through all that and then ordain me. Or if I'm ordained, that's what I'm looking for. Because I know personally and from individuals I trust deeply and greatly, the fact is, is the surgical procedure is a non-stop process unless you and I elect not to have it. And he will not force it on you. I watched the other day when they came in to get Brother Richard for his surgery and you know, nurse comes in and the OR nurse comes to you all know the practices of all this, y'all are experts in that. And then another person comes in. Every one of those individuals are coming in. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Do you understand this? Yes, sir. I understand this. I signed here. <laughs> and finally, one of the other doctors came in and he said, now I'm going to need you to sign this and this has to do with the DNR and has to do with, uh, that has to do with what we're going to do with you in the operating room and all. And you know, I need you to sign this and you're in agreement with that or you didn't sign this and you're in agreement with that. And you know what I realized? At any point he wanted to, you know what he could have said? I'm not signing that. And you know what they would have said? We're not doing the surgery. Because believe it or not, even though the doctor is the one with the scalpel in his hands, it is you that becomes responsible and liable for whatever occurs on that table. He either gets a chance to operate on you and maybe make you better, but if he slips with that scalpel, he may end your life. But that's what you did when you signed off on it. The liability now falls on you, not on them. Oh, sue them till the cows come home. But you agreed to the surgery. But often when we agree to the surgery, we agree because we think we know, like the doctor knows, how that surgery is going to turn out. No medical experience, no ability to know, but we just know, oh, if I get this, man, I'm going to be running marathons and I'm going to be going back to doing this and back to doing that and so on and so forth. doctor never said that. But when you signed off on it, I know how it's going to turn out. Are you with me? And I watched him sign and I thought, hmm, he is in complete control. He needs this surgery. I ain't telling him that. You say, what? I'm not the one laying on the table. I'm not the one going to walk away paralyzed or dead. What do you think? I ain't got a doctor. You need to talk it over to him. The Lord said, hey, I'm diagnosed the problem. Right. Lord, it, it's, it's that nurse I saw, the charge nurse. He, mm, no. I, it, the, the admittance nurse. No. Ha, had to be the janitor cleaning up the room, didn't change my sheets. No, they're not the reason. Well, well, what about the person that was rolling me from room to room, ran into the walls and everything like that? Bad driver, I agree with that. But yeah, they're, they're not the problem. The problem is, is you're the one that has the disease. Yes. Yes. Right. And I have the solution. Amen. But you have to be willing to sign off on it. Mean Lord, it's going to make me better? Yeah, but it's going to hurt like the dance. They 
put my dad years ago. See, he's been gone 30 years this year. A lot of historical things we've remembered in the last couple of weeks together. And they put him 10 years before that. So it'll be 40 years ago, maybe 42. But at any rate, 40-something years, about 40 years ago, they put him into the hospital and they gave him uh, blood that was tainted with hepatitis and created a bunch of problems and all that. And I don't know why they allowed me to do it. Maybe because I was a policeman, I don't know. But they actually let me go back in the, the tip-top ICU thing. They just told me what you can do, where you can go, and you can't do this and that and the other. And they allowed me to go back there. So they're in the room, and it's like a big thing, all glass across here. And everybody in there has had major surgery, and a lot of them were heart patients and all that kind of stuff. And they had him from just underneath his chin right here all the way down to his belly button. It had been split up, and they had staples all through there, stitches and all. And I remember after he woke up and then they were trying to get him up and that kind of thing to try to get him to walk for the purpose of clearing his lungs, I guess, and all that. Y'all would know. I, I don't know about that stuff. But at any rate, they, they get him up like that. I'll never forget what he said. He said, I'm glad to be alive. He said, but that every time I take a step, I can feel my rib cage rubbing against itself. So I asked the doctor, I said, well, what is that he's feeling? Is that like something in his heart? He said, no, we actually take bailing wire. This is way back when now, so I don't know about the procedures, and I'm just telling you. And he said, what we do is, is we run it through this way and run it back up that way. And he said, and we twist it off. And he said, every so often, he has that, he's, that's a rib cage until that cartilage grows back together. And he said, so what he's going to feel is when he takes a move, he's going to feel that sawing back and forth. It hurt him deeply. But he was glad, even though he got, we didn't know till years later that he had gotten bad blood. But can I say this to you? It took a long time to recover. He was older by then. Not even as old as I am, but it took a long time. Guess what? While he was on medicine, he actually changed. The pain and the medicine changed who he was. And he began to get better. And we were grateful for the 10 years we had, even though he went home early. We were grateful for the pain he endured for our benefit. But I was old enough by then when he had the surgery to know he had to sign off on it. And in those days, heart surgery isn't like it is now. Nowadays, heart surgery is almost like knee surgery. So they tell me. But back then, that was a big deal. But he was willing to go through that, I think, because it wasn't just that he wanted to live longer. My dad was always ready to go. I think that he did it for the benefit of us and for the benefit of my mama. And I think he endured the pain for the right reason, but nonetheless, he had to endure the pain. And I am trying to make an illustration for you to see. As, as upsetting as it may be to some of you, I'm just giving you a personal testimony. If you're not in this boat, don't listen. Sorry I took your time. I'll try to make it up to you later with a message that's more palatable to you. But in the meantime, the Lord says you need heart surgery. And I say, well, Lord, I'm happy to just let it tick like it is and let it run out when it wants to run out. Be done when I'm done because I don't want to endure the pain. I know that when he went in, he had no idea how many months of recovery it was going to take him to be out of circulation. And how he had to, who was used to ministering to everybody else, how he had to allow somebody to minister to him. Yeah. I leaned over to my brother yesterday and I said to him, I said, this is a position I don't really know a lot about. He said, what do you mean, man? Haven't you done a lot of funerals? I said, no. I'm usually, min min usually ministering to the people on the front row. Now I'm on the front row. Yeah. It's a game changer when you're the one that people are trying to minister to 
It's a humbling thing. It requires some surgery because you realize you're not as self-sufficient as you think you are. Yeah. Amen. And somebody comes up and presses their hand in yours or gives you a hug or just a preacher, we love you and we're praying for you. Well, you want so bad inside. I, I'm good. I'm, I'm all right. Praise the Lord. I know where she's at. You know, it's like, just shut up. You need to know what it's like to feel how other people feel. Surgery hurts. It'll make me a better pastor. It'll be better for you that the Lord can use those things to teach me things that I couldn't learn otherwise, but it's surgery nonetheless. They tell me, I, again, I don't know about this, they tell me that any time you do anything that's invasive, including, have you ever gone and got a shot? That needle is so stinking small. I mean, I know it looks this big, but I mean, it's such a little tiny thing. But they tell me, like even if you're taking a diabetes, say, this is what they tell me now. They tell me, you know, they got to put the little cotton swab on there and swab you and get all that stuff off. And I don't know why they always do this, but then they look at the swab like, man, did you take a bath last night? <laughs> And they get done with that little cotton swab and then they got to go over and put it in this, you know, hazardous waste thing to make you feel like, man, what in the world? And, and then they pop you with that and then they got to wipe it again. They tell me why. That's an entrance inside for infection to get in, even though it's a minuscule, minor, little tiny hole. It now has the potential to become something much larger because we weren't cautious before and after the injection took place. And the greater the incision, the greater the, the, the potential for something bad to creep in while something good was taking place. Paul goes through a surgical procedure. Can I read this to you? And I'm still trying to get you out at noon. I'll try to finish this stuff up tonight, but I, I don't know if you can tell I'm preaching you from the heart. It's not unprepared. This is me on the wheel. This is me. I'm glad it's a lump of clay that doesn't have legs because I'd be done jump. I, I'd be done. I, I would have already gotten off of the wheel. You say, why? He doesn't need me to be a teapot. He just wants a common, ordinary plate. And that mashing process, it's a little bit painful. I'm glad that once he masses it and breaks it, he starts to mingle some tears in there and makes it more pliable. But when it first gets broken, it's pretty powerful. Look at Paul's process of his surgery going place. Paul said, are they ministers of Christ? Verse 23, I speak as a fool. I am more. What are you a minister? Paul, you're a minister of what? In your intellect, your training under the uh, Ab Agabus, uh, uh, because you're a lawyer, Paul, because of your status in the community, Paul, your status with the, fan the Sanhedrin and, and the Pharisees and said, no, Paul said, in labors more abundant, I work harder than most. In stripes above measure more than most. I'm in prison more frequently and in deaths often. That's not deaths of other people. That's Paul on a regular basis facing his own demise. Encircled and encamped about with constant individuals who want his life. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice beaten with rods. Once stoned. Thrice suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep and journeyings awful, perils of waters, robbers, my own countrymen, perils by the heathen, perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, perils. Can I say it doesn't look like Paul can escape perils among false brethren? In weariness and painfulness, watchings often in hunger and thirst and fastings often cold and nakedness, besides those things which are without that cometh upon me daily, 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 the care of all the churches. And Paul said, who is weak? I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concerning mine. Paul said, that's my continual surgical procedure and it never stopped until the day his head went in the basket. Paul finished in the surgical operating room 
sitting in the jail cell, mocked, belittled, made fun of, comes out, has an opportunity to present his side of the story in front of the who's who of that particular time. Nonetheless, of Felix and Agrippa sitting there and Paul has an opportunity to give a testimony and he gives a testimony and said, I'm happy and I'm guilty of what they accuse me of, but thank God I met the Lord on the road to Damascus. Paul, we're going to kill you. Well, I've been through a lot of other surgeries and I guess this one will now take my life for I'm now ready to be offered. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Paul, you finished your course in the hospital? Yeah. You finished your course, Paul, in a, a great coliseum surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, a great crusade that was occurring. Paul, I mean, you went out healing people, raising the dead. Paul, you went out with your name in every headline. You went out with everybody in town knowing you with a great move of people getting saved and following after Jesus Christ. Why, Paul, man, what a way to go out. Nope, I went out from a jail cell to a chopping block my head rolled off in a basket. I finished my life in God's surgical OR. God wasn't done with me until I was gone. Paul's our pattern. I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, when's the last time I had surgery? When's the last time I even dared to walk into the throne room and instead of saying, Lord, this is what I need, and this is when I think you need to do it, this is how I think you need to do it, and this is all the situations of what I, oh, and by the way, I got some complaints on, and on, and on, and on, and by the way, could you, could you, could you, when was the last time I walked into the throne room and approached boldly and said, Lord, I want to know, I'm having a checkup, tell me, do I need surgery? Amen. Not, Lord, they need surgery. They need surgery. They need surgery. He needs surgery. She needs surgery. Church needs surgery. Lord, me. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. It's very easy to see everybody else who needs surgery. I went past that hallway on nine, a Weaver Tower. <coughs> and I'm walking down that hallway and I'm looking at the rooms. I'm looking for the room number. I'm not trying to be invasive. I'm not, a, I'm not one of these individuals who's morbid and I love to see people suffering or something. I'm looking and the beds are full and some are surrounded with people and they're down there and they're weeping and they're crying. Some are praying and some are cursing and people are getting lined up to get ready to go out. And early in the morning they come in, they line the beds up, man, and they're taking them off and God only knows if they're coming back. And I found a vacant room. They had already rolled the individual out. You could tell all the oxygen stuff was hanging down on the wall there. You could tell somebody had been there. I'm supposing they probably took him out for surgery. And the Lord said, that's a good room right there. Would you just step in there? I said, no, her room is down here. Yeah, but you're the one that needs the surgery. I got a room waiting for you. Lord, I need to get ready. These people are having surgery. And these people have this problem. And the Lord says, yeah, but if you don't have surgery, you're not going to be here to take care of that. I had a doctor say to me yesterday, full-fledged, dyed-in-the-wool doctor say to me yesterday. She said, I've known her for years. She was there when my dad died. She said to me, she's a close friend, she said to me, David, you do realize that with everything you have going on, that if you're not willing to get the help you need, you can't help the people that are depending on you. That's from somebody who's been practicing for over 30 years. Why did she have to tell me that? I said, oh yeah, I know, I say airplane theology, you know. She goes, what? And I said, you know, you, you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself because of oxygen deprivation, you lose motor skills, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, uh, okay. Like, she wasn't impressed with my medical knowledge at all. And she goes, what? And I said, you know, on an airplane, you have to put it on yourself first before you can take it. She goes, oh. She said, 
nice duck. <laughs> it got me thinking about four o'clock this morning. You ask him whether or not you need surgery. Lord, I think I'm doing pretty good. I mean, let's look at the evidence. The last time I went to our doctor, I went in and I just knew I was fine. I mean, I was sure of it. I didn't have any whatever you would call symptoms or whatever you would call. I didn't, I, I mean, there was no, I just like, I only, well, to be honest with you, the only reason I went was because she insisted and wasn't going to make me supper if I didn't. So I was, okay, I'll go ahead and go. But I went in like, hey, can we move this along? How are you feeling? I feel great. What about this? What about this? Doing great. How are you doing? Doing great. Doing good. She goes, oh, well. What are you doing in here? I said, I, my wife wants me to get checked. She's worried about maybe something being wrong or this and that and the other. She said, well, you're feeling fine. I said, yep. She goes, okay, well, let's just go by that then. She said, or you can let me be the doctor and I'll tell you whether you're doing great or not. She's like, don't, she's one of those no bedside manner people. I don't have time to fool around with your foolishness kind of deal. And she ran some tests and did it. Guess what? I'm great. <laughs> There's just a couple of little things that need to be addressed, you know. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're minor. But I'm not, what do they call it, symptomatic? <laughs> She's like, we need to get this under control. Or you may have to have a surgical procedure to correct it later. Lord said, how you doing? Great. How you feeling? Perfect. Doing good. All systems go. Okay, well, good. We're going to go by how you feel, or are you going to let me be the doctor? Okay, you can be the doctor, but I only got about 15 minutes. So be quick about it. He said, it doesn't take long. I can tell you your problem. It's not an ear infection. It's not eye trouble, it's heart trouble. Yes. You need open heart surgery, boy. Yes. The problem's your heart. Again, I know you, everybody doesn't need open heart surgery. I did. See, where are you now? I'm laying on the table. See, you look like you're standing here. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, I'm laying on the table. You say, why? He, when, once you're under his anesthesia, you don't get up until he wakes you up. He is not the fastest surgeon in the world, except when it comes to salvation. Man, I mean, he is in the twinkling of an eye. At the rapture, he can get you. But beyond that, you're under his control now. Lord, I think I'm ready to get up. You're dead. You can't talk when you're under that medicine. So shut up. Let me do my work. I don't need any coaching from the sidelines. I've done this millions of times, boy. Again, I'm just talking about me. Because I got comfortable and complacent. And before long, heart got a little fat around it. I think there's a name for that. You have to ask one of these folks. Things called visceral fat. That's dangerous stuff. You can look pretty decent on the outside, but when that stuff gets around your organs on the inside, if I, if I understand this stuff right, maybe they have been told this, when that stuff gets around you, it can literally strangle your inside organs. And you can die and be skinny, but have fat on the inside. Got a little ring of fat around that. Around your kidneys. Around your bladder. Around all that stuff on the inside they tell me about. Preacher, why, why this? I don't know, maybe just me 
telling you I'm on the operating table, come see me when the recovery. And be careful when I'm in recovery because you know when people are in recovery, they're kind of tender. Did you know that? They have a tendency to perceive things differently than they really are. They're still under the influence. But when he gets through with the surgery, they move me to recovery and they wake me up and I don't know where I'm at. Come by and visit me. And then eventually I'll go to rehab, learn how to do better with the new surgery and recover from the pain and hopefully come out better and finish the race strong. And heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Can I give you something to ponder for just a moment? This is a question only you can answer. I cannot answer. There's only one doctor that can diagnose this kind of trouble. And that's the great physician. No preacher, no husband, no wife, no father, no mother, no grandma or pawpaw can tell you whether or not you need surgery. I'm not talking about for salvation. If you're lost, your heart's going to give out and you're going to go to hell. We know that. And I know the majority of you here today. And all I'm saying to you is, is this is far and beyond salvation. So you have to ask him, oh Lord, I need surgery. And if so, why don't you come and just sign the release form. Just sign the permission slip. Lord, you have permission to do whatever you need to do to get me better. And just sign off. God spoke to you. You come. No music. It's a serious moment.